All right. Um, I don't want to take too much of people's times. It's 7.02 right now, and uh, I think people will probably still be filtering in. So maybe I'll start doing uh, my introductions, and by the time we get to uh, Truck and Bill, uh, we'll have more people come and join us. I know we've had a, a couple more, about 20 or 30 more people who are already RSVP. So let me first uh, start off with uh, a thank you for everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is kind of the first of um, many uh, distinguished guest speaker series that the LA County Asian American Employees Association will be holding. Um, my name is Eddie Yen and I am the president of the LA County Asian American Employees Association, or like we like to call ourselves, La Sea now. Uh, that might be taken away by a couple other La Seas, but uh, we're just going to co-op that one for now and uh, see if we could make that be the dominant La Sea. Uh, I'd also like to uh, introduce uh, several of our other board members who are on this call with us. I'm just going to read out all the names uh, of our board members. Uh, well, I might as well just look at it because I think they're all pretty much around here. Uh, we have Truck Moore, who is our director of, um, what is it here? What are you, Truck? Director of public, public Relations. <laughs> oh, and then uh, she's waving right there. Uh, Jody Chen, who is our public information officer. Uh, I have Elizabeth Hahn, who is our chair of uh, programming events. Venkat Petty, who is our director of program events. Hi there. Um, the person known as notifications, I believe, is Matt Yang. He is our secretary. Joanna De La Cuesta is our treasurer. I have Robert Isozaki. And he is our chair of, hold on here. Uh, recruitment. And then I'm um, going down, let's see here. Diane Park, want to show your face a little bit? She's essentially our social chair. So the director of party. <laughs> and okay, and then that's uh, all the board members that we have here today. I'm sure we'll have more people trickling in. Uh, anyways, uh, so this we kind of started this uh, series of speaker events because um, uh, about, a, about a year ago, we started really thinking about how we could start creating more value and benefits to our members. And last couple of months, uh, we brought on a whole new board. Hence, we uh, put out the, uh, our inaugural newsletter that was um, really you know, uh, spearheaded by Jody Chen. And the, the newsletter gave us an opportunity to have a voice uh, and really get some communication out to our members. But as we were putting that together, you know, the incidents is uh, the shooting incident in Atlanta, Georgia, involving Asian Americans, and then the the following impact it had on many people due to you know I what I think many people would imagine is just you know, the lack of interest or the, the, the words that the law enforcement were making that kind of really uh, impacted how people felt uh, about being Asian American. And so we, we wanted to make sure we expressed ourselves. Uh, I think what many Asian Americans have felt, you know, and this has been happening for a very long time, is we just never had a voice and that we never really speak up. So we, want, we wanted to speak out much like many other Asian Americans, and we decided to use the newsletter as the opportunity to do so. Uh, since publishing our newsletter, I forwarded it to the uh, department heads for the County of Los Angeles. I've also forwarded it on to the Board of Supervisors, and we've had very positive um, feedback. You know, it was uh, also, in addition to the newsletter, we also issued an open letter that uh, expressed the feelings of uh, many of our Asian American uh, board board members. And, um, you know, I was very happy to see that uh, all the other employee associations in the county co-signed that letter and were very supportive in, um, in the message that we were trying to bring. So what are we doing now, you know, as we move on with L L La Sea? You know, uh, for our members, we want to let people know that, you know, we are continuously striving to build value to your membership. Uh, 
uh, to people who we want to bring on board, whether you're a new recruit or you are uh, a current member. We want to let you know uh, what we are striving to do. Uh, this new board, you know, in the last se several months, we've put together some strategic priorities. You know, uh, in the past, we were well known for our meet and greet banquets and, and so forth. And we had focused on community service events, career development, uh, as well as connecting events or networking events. But I think what we recognized is that, you know, there was a space that it was missing that we would like to fill, which was the, the space of advocacy for Asian Americans in, in LA County. So uh, we want to let you know that as we move forward in this next year, you know, our goal is to produce more program events, you know, focused on uh, advocacy, community service, uh, career development, and um, connecting people. So I encourage people to uh, sign up. Um, if you are not a member already, please check out our website at lacaaea.com. Uh, we still are making some improvements on the website. We have a membership application there. If you received our newsletter, at the bottom of the newsletter, there is also an application that you could fill out and email it to us. Um, and we will be able to uh, sign you up as a member, add you onto our MailChimp, MailChimp's uh, list, and you'll be able to receive notices like uh, our monthly newsletter, as well as other notices like the Distinguished Speaker Series. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Truck Moore so that we could start this conversation with our former CEO, Bill Fukuoka. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, first off, I just want to thank Bill for doing this. You know, I had the opportunity to work with you when you were at the county, and it's just great to be able to see you again and to moderate, you know, this conversation that we're going to have tonight. Um, I do want to say that, you know, naturally, as an attorney, I promise not to take your deposition. So if the line of questions, you know, go down that route, you know, just let me know. Um, but I'm just hoping, you know, to foster a great conversation. Of our uh, so that being said, uh, Bill, welcome. Um, you are a longtime Angelino with a long history in the county. Can you please share with us um, your parents' family background and you know where you grew up? Because it's just fantastic to hear um, where you originally came from. Well, um, born and raised in. Los Angeles, um, initially Boyle Heights, and for those who know Boyle Heights, it was, I call it the, the ultimate melting pot, because in my neighborhood were, of course, you know, Japanese Americans, but so there's Chinese, Latino, African Americans, um, big Jewish community. Uh, in fact, one street before is, it was named Cesar Chavez Boulevard, it was called Brooklyn. And the vast majority of the businesses were owned by um, those of the Jewish faith. You had Italians, you had Russians who fled communist Russia. You know, they, they were referred to themselves as the white Russians, were all white. But it was just, a, um, it was interesting because it was, it was so diverse that you, you had to make friends with people from different cultures, different backgrounds, and different beliefs. And um, I'll be 69 this year. I was born in, in 52. And so that's shortly after World War II. Every single person in my neighborhood, every father fought in the Pacific Theater or their brothers fought in the Pacific Theater. And the majority lost family in that war. And, if, and for those of you, a lot of you are too young, except for my, my buddy Ralph over here, the, um, on TV were war movies, and it was uh, Audie Murphy and, you know, you know James Stewart and, and John Wayne, and they kept saying during the movies, kill the Jap, kill the Jap. Well, we're on the street, they saw that, and when you're a little boy, we didn't have, we didn't play indoors. Everything, you know, when the sun came up, we hit the street, and the sun went down, we came home, and you played either sports or you played war, and guess who I got to be? I got to be the Jap, kill the Jap. And I recently spoke at a, at a, a this event that was, um, that dealt with uh, the Asian hate crimes. And I told folks, this is not new. You all know it. Every single one of you have experienced some degree of racism. It wasn't a, uh, it was rare when I was a kid, 
I, where a day would pass, I wasn't called a jack. Or, you know, at least once a week, I'd get in a fight. But you couldn't fight everybody. But I think one lesson I learned, and it's a lesson that I took throughout my career, is the ability to develop strong quality relationships. And so when I was getting jumped, in time, I had friends jumping in for me and helping me. When I, was, when I started school, we moved to Montebello. In Montebello, like a lot of ethnic communities, whether you're, you know, because in the AAPI community, there are just so many different communities. But people tend to move with their other members of your same community. That's why you have clusters throughout LA County. Uh, for, for me, for JAs, so you have the Boyle Heights East Side cluster, you have, you go on the West Side with Culver City, West LA cluster, you have Gardena, of course. But we moved that, we moved to the, um, to the, to Montebello. But even moving there, you, I was still Japanese. But you learn, when you, you, you learn how to develop strong relationships. And that's something that uh, I can't um, estimate, uh, I can't emphasize stronger. That's Absolutely. a little bit about my background. And, and, you know, Bill, you mentioned that, you know, you were born after uh, World War II. Uh, were your parents um, one of, uh, were they interned in the local internment camps in, in California? Both, both sides of my family went to Heart Mountain and Heart Mountain, Wyoming. My grandfather had a distinction of, he was extremely wealthy. He owned the largest Oldsmobile dealership west of the Mississippi for any ethnicity, white, anything. And again, as part of our different cultures, what, when, you, um, when, they, when Japanese went to buy cars, you buy from your own. So every farmer, every business person, every household on the West Coast, for as far north as uh, even Vancouver, all the way down to San Diego, and especially you get into the, 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 the farm country of Imperial, Coachella, and so on, they bought their trucks and cars from my grandfather. And there's a story, if you guys are curious, go online and look up Fujioka Automobile. And it speaks to his efforts. He tried to, he invented a, a coal oil burning uh, engine. He tried to build one in, uh, uh, automobile in Japan with the Spencer brothers, but it was destroyed in the earthquake. But he helped um, rebuild Tokyo. He was fabulously wealthy and um, became, he developed a relationship with Emperor Hirohito. Well, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, he was the first, per the, well, family, the, the legend is, he was the first person they picked up. He was picked up at 7.15 in the morning, right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And they took him, he disappeared for six months. He ended up spending some time in Leavenworth and he came back just a shattered man. They must have did really bad things to him. My, at one point we were, we were traveling one time and my dad took us to a, um, a bluff overlooking Carlsbad. And my mom said, he would never talk about it. He, he said, as far as you can see this way, as far as you can see this way, this was our land. We had 250 acres on the beach in Carlsbad. And um, the, when he was charged with war crimes, so the government confiscated everything, took everything from him. And it was, you know, it's, you see that tragedy. And at the same time, my father um, volunteered to fight in the war. So he was part of the 442 in the 100th uh, Battalion. He had two brown stars and a couple of purple hearts but he lost his best friend in his arms. And then his cousin who was raised with him also died five days after the war was over because the, the word didn't get out to the troops. And so he had demons. Those, when you go through something like that, you have demons. My family sued the federal government in 1959. And based on what they could prove, the government gave my family $900,000, which represented less than a nickel for every dollar they could prove. When you do the simple math, that's 18 million in 1959. You could buy a Volkswagen for 1500 back then, maybe $1,000. Right. Well, and, and it, car it, it, is now prime real estate, you know. Oh, it's, you know, I was, you know, they talk about, um, I saw that article about that African-American family who lost their, um, 
property in Manhattan Beach. I think they call it Burns Park or something. And they talk about giving it back to them. Well, the stories of eminent domain or the stories of government taking land. And I know uh, uh, Supervisor Hahn wants to give it back to him. Well, that's gonna be an in interesting box to open. Because what are you gonna do about Chavez Ravine when they, they took out all the Latino families to build Dodger Stadium? And what are you gonna do about, you know, think about the, the 60 freeway went right through the middle of East LA. There's hundreds of Latino and Japanese and Russian and you name the, the ethnicity whose homes were lost to eminent domain. So it's, it's, it's quite a history there. No, absolutely. Now, you know, you were raised in Boyle Heights by your dad, who obviously, you know, was recovering from some of the issues after World War II. Uh, what, what drove you to go to college? And was college a big thing in Boyle Heights at the time? Uh, well, education, I think, for a lot of uh, AAPI families is, is the key. And it's, you know, part of it was that you got you to gotta get up, get out, and make something of yourself. I was accepted to almost almost every school here in LA. But I had kind of a wild background and my dad tore up every acceptance for every school in LA and said, you're leaving town. You gotta get away from these crazy guys. And I ended up in Santa Cruz. Fantastic. Now, from Santa Cruz, what was your first job um, in the government? Which, which is, a lot of people don't know is, um, my first job was as a janitor for, for Santa Cruz County. And I was, um, I was on scholarship, but for those of you who have been on scholarship, it doesn't pay for everything like food, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I had to work. So I saw this job offering and it was for um, a, a school for autistic kids. And the hours were anytime after seven o'clock till seven in the morning. And so it was perfect. I, I'd go there at midnight and I'd clean the place and you know, I'd get my so many hours in and then I'd go on the weekend and, and mow the lawn and do all that other good stuff. But I worked there for three years. And so when I tell people I have 44 years of government, of that, three years was as a custodian. But you know what's, what's real, real interesting is um, it taught me a, a, an, a, an amazing lesson because when I was there, I was all but invisible. I was a kid who cleaned the toilets and mopped the floors and took out the trash. And there, most of them didn't even talk to me. And there are some, oh my God, I tell you stories about things in the, in the staff bathrooms and everything else and how vile they were. But they were, um, I learned that um, the importance, because at one point, I went to the director and gave her a couple of ideas on how to improve the environment and stuff. And she was this amazing person. I can't remember her name. But first she said, you know, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. But I, I'm pretty persistent. And when, she's, when she finally listened to me, she goes, well, wow, this could really work. This is good. I took that, you know, I think for some of you who, who worked with me when I was with the county, I used to say front door, back door. Everyone from the front door, and that can be the receptionist to the back door, and that was me in the CEO's position, has equal value. I used to tell people, you know, just you know, when you see the person that's coming in at night to uh, work on your facility, whether it's clean or do whatever, stop and talk to them. Thank them for what they do because they help your environment. And that, there's other stories where that, that has helped my career path. In, in unusual ways, but actually helped my career path. But paying respect to people at all levels, invaluable. No, absolutely. Sounds like that was a great lesson you learned at really early age. Now, you know, moving from being a janitor at Santa Cruz, um, how did you make your way up? You know, well, one, how did you make your way back to LA County? And then, you know, how did you get into government in LA County? Well, I came home. I think a lot, like, again, our culture, the AAPI culture, family is, is important. So I came home to family. I still had a couple of grandparents who were still alive. Um, they passed after I came back, but um, I came back and was a, was a little wild. And um, 
came home one night, I think about three in the morning, and my um, everything I owned was on the front porch. And I tried to open up the door, and my dad had changed the locks and said, if you're going to be a bum, you're not going to be a bum here. So he threw me out, locked me out. My brother was leaving the, to go to law school up north, and he said, well, I have this apartment. You know, I paid for a few months. You get your stuff together. And so I just started applying for everything, you know, with the intent, candidly, not with the intent of staying in public service. I didn't get the bug until later. And at one point when I got it, it was really, really strong. Fantastic. Now, your brother went to law school. Now, I believe he's gone on to become a, a judge. Is that correct? Yeah, he's a juvenile court judge. He sits in, um, in Silmar. But he, went, he, he started working with gangs when he was 17. His best friend was a guy by the name of Richard Polanco. And Richard went on to be one of the most powerful Latinos in, in the state legislature. But they both, you know, committed themselves to um, working with, with kids, gang workers. Fantastic. Yeah, now you've got quite a distinguished good career between the county and with the city of L.A. Could you share some of your um, experiences at the city of L.A. and then we'll move to the county? What, what people may not know is my first job was with the city through what was called the CETA program. The Comprehensive Education, was it Education and Training Act? I think it was a Carter program, mainly to help a lot of vets returning from uh, the Vietnam War. And other people who were, you had to meet certain, certain requirements in terms of, um, um, I it had some economic requirements, if I, if I remember right. And I was just broke, broke, broke. So my first job was with LAPD as an administrative intern, I had several positions that I was going for and I wanted to go in the personnel department, but instead they, they popped me down LAPD. What's interesting though is my, my first, not supervisor, because I had a sergeant who was a supervisor, but my lieutenant was Bernard Parks, who went on to become the chief of police at the same time I was the city administrative officer. But in, at that time, which was in the, when was that? That was in 75. There was, a, um, there was a push to hire more Asians. And they kept asking me, they said, why don't you join the department? Why don't you join the department? And I said, no, I don't, be a, I don't want to be a police officer. And they said, ah, it's probably because you're a communist, you're gay, or you're a drug user. And looking at you, Fujioka, you're probably all three. And there's still that, you know, Mind you, in 75, we're only, you know, we're not even a generation away from World War II. So I'm here one day, well, before that, I've always had this really, really good work ethic. Um, it was taught to me, I, I was partially raised by an uncle because my father had, he had issues, he had demons. He was a gardener. But, but he, you know, I, I'm used to getting up real, real early and working on long, long days. So I would stay at work until 8 o'clock at night. And Bernie Parks, and the stories about Bernie Parks and the racism he, he experienced, but he would also be there late at night. And he'd peek in and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm working. And it'd be just those short conversations. But then after a few months, he'd come in and he goes, come on, talk to me. And we started talking to each other and talking to each other about our experiences and what he was going through and what I was going through. Well, one day I, I was at work and this older Caucasian man said, hey, Fujioka. I said, and I knew he was going to give me some crap. And I said, what? He goes, are you one of Buddha's bandits? And I said, you know, just leave me alone. And he goes, you know, my father killed a lot of you Japs during the war. So I told him to do something physically impossible. And he went to grab me. And I was, I was like, like a lot of young Asians, we're all training back then, right? We're all taking something or another. And I locked him up and he went for his gun. He had his hand on his gun and I hit him. One of the best punches I ever threw. And I think I broke his jaw. Well, all hell broke loose. The guys were jumping on me, but we were part of the Equal Employment Opportunity Unit of all units. And the, and the officers of color, the Latino and African-Americans, jumped in and pulled guys off of me. 
And um, it was crazy. But Bernie was walked in about that time. He saw all this commotion. And he said, what, what happened? And I told him what happened. And he threw me in his office. He goes, you're dead. They're going to get you. You have no idea. They're going to get you. I said, okay. I said, but he did this, you know, killed a lot of Japs during the war and so on. He says, it doesn't matter. You hit a cop, Bill. So about two weeks later, they planted drugs on me. And I was sitting at my desk, and they go, look at, look at, fell out of Food Joker's pocket. It's drugs. And I said, that ain't mine. And I said, look at, it's drugs. If I was taking drugs back, my uncle would have killed me. And I, a um, little off color, I knew what was happening. So I grabbed my sergeant's coffee cup, and I, I pulled my pants down. and said, I'm going to pee in this cup in front of all of you. I want it tested. And of course, the sergeant goes, my daughter gave me that cup. <laughs> Give me that cup. <laughs> and then I got in another fight at the police academy about, mm, about five days later. And I knew I had to go. So I left. But because I was um, some of the experience I had, I qualified for a job in the county in the workers' comp division. And I became a vocational rehab counselor. Because as part of the EEO unit, I handled the program to hire uh, disabled workers for LAPD. And that qualified me for this other job. So I spent, I, I, I moved over to the county. And so I went three years city, 19 years county, went back to the city for 10 years, then came back to the county for whatever number of years, about seven yeah. years. And, you know, I, I think a lot of us, I mean, I, when, when you were the, our, our CEO from 2007 to 2014, um, I did not remember or recall that you had actually been with the county for 19 years with a very impressive career. So could you share with us all of the various county departments that you worked for? And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then if you could follow up with um, whether you think our members and participants today should look you know, all over the county um, for promotions and not just stick with their county department. I think that, I think the beauty with the county is you can work in how many different departments, you know, 34, 37 different departments. I was in workers' comp and I, I knew I wanted to, um, to move up. Because, you know, what I was making in workers' comp was hardly anything. But my, my track, because workers' comp is part of personnel, was going downtown to the personnel department. But like a lot of departments, and all of you have experienced it, when you try to move from division to division or department to department, it's extremely difficult. Because most people hire the person they know. They hire within. And so... I would go and try to get interviews with different division chiefs and they would say, no, I have somebody. No, I have somebody. So one day I was, you know, I was feeling real bad. And I was just, I, I developed a friendship with this custodian who would come in at night and he'd always come in and we'd sit and talk for a while and, and I'd ask him about his family and ask me about mine and what I was doing, my background. And I said, you know, I just can't get a break. He goes, who are you trying to meet? I said, well, these three vacancies, and here are the division chiefs. He goes, you want to work for Dick Raymond? He's, he's extremely difficult to work for. And I said, you know, I just want a chance to go downtown. Because once I'm downtown, I have a wider exposure. He goes, I'll call my daughter. His daughter was Dick Raymond's secretary. And he, so I talked to her and she goes, he comes in every day at 7.30 and he has coffee and likes to read his paper. So why don't you come by and see me? So I went by there and she's, oh, Mr. Rayman, I want you to meet my friend. And he goes, oh, come on in. I ended up working for him. <clears throat> and he, he promoted me several times, but he was a jerk. Oh my God, was he difficult to work for. But it was interesting is that I knew he would be a challenge, but when I would apply for other jobs and they'd say, Dick Raymond promoted you? He goes, yeah, that's all I need to know. Because he, you know, he was just so so difficult, it, just a a blatant racist. He would um, not against Asians. He had this he had this this affinity for 
for Asians. But the, the management staff and the Department of Personnel were all African Americans. Behind, you know how they would put pictures, department head on top, then the deputy directors in a row? <laughs> well, he was an avid photographer. He loved gorillas. He put up in that same format pictures of four gorillas. And he referred to them as, these are our, our leaders, our <laughs> department heads. Just blatant stuff. But what's interesting, so I went from personnel, and first personnel with personnel, then it got merged with the CAO's office. It became the Office of Human Resources. And then, so I became part of the CAO. Then I had the chance to um, become the personnel officer for the CAO. So I did that for a short time. But backing up a little bit, I, you know, from Dick Raymond, I became an uh, exam analyst. And I, I ran all these different exams. One was the Sergeant Sheriff exam. And we, I sat on an interview board for three weeks with Lee Baca when he was a lieutenant. And another guy, but his last name is, I'm blanking out of his last name, he was an African American guy. And he was, um, went on to become the number two in the sheriff's department. But we sat together for three weeks. So you just sit and talk in between candidates and you, you develop a relationship. So that's another thing. And I used, sometimes when I used to give a talk, I'd say it's, you think about a, a grid of a, um, of a city layout and there's, there's streets and intersections. Well, within that grid, that's your, that's your career. And you're gonna come back to other intersections again and come back the same streets. And so at one point in my life, I developed a relationship with Bernie Parks. And that was in 75. I came back in 97 as a personnel director for the city, and he was an assistant chief at that time. Then they became the CAO, and he became the chief of police. We were already friends. Same thing with Lee Baca. In 81, I developed a relationship with Lee Baca as a lieutenant. And there were times in my career where I had to call these people and say, no, I need help on something. And they would reach out and they would help. But I go back to the story of the janitor and the, um, and his daughter, if I didn't have a relationship with that person, if I looked at him like he was invisible and just someone who was cleaning our toilet or emptying the trash and didn't treat him with respect, he never would have asked his daughter to help me. And his daughter, his daughter said, you know, my dad just loves you. He says, every night you're there and you spend time, you talk to him and everyone else treats him like dirt just as some guy cleaning the toilets and, and emptying the trash. But the importance of treating everyone with, with respect, I think will really, really help you in your career. But then from there, you saw I was an exam analyst, who was interesting. I, it used to be what was called a, a, a HSA, Health Systems Agency. It was, the county went through this effort where they're gonna create their own health agency. And, and then it died. But they asked me to, to work with the director and her number two to do all the examinations for that agency. The number two was a guy by the name of Dick Pacheco. And so that was in maybe 81. Then I go on up to the CAO and I'm the personnel officer. An opening occurred in General Hospital for a personnel director. And a friend of mine, another, another AAPI, Dana Takauchi, was the personnel director, but he moved down to Harvard. So he told his boss, there's this great guy downtown, you know, he's this, he's that, he's, he's personnel officer for the CAO, but he has all this potential. And what's his name? He goes, Bill Fujioka. It was Dick Pacheco. And Dick Pacheco goes, I know Bill, he's wonderful. I'll call him up and offer him the job. Again, intersections. You come back, you, you just, the importance of developing strong relationships and functioning with character and integrity, people will remember. People, you know, I, I, I joke that someday I'll write a book and tell all the terrible stories about the board and all their secrets. But one chapter will be, they know you before you come. 
Because each one of you, if you've ever left your department to go to another department, or say you're within health services, and health services is huge, right? And there's separate departments within health services. Before you step foot in a new assignment, they will know about you because they call their friends and say, tell me about Fujioka. What is he like? What does he do? What is he, what is he not like? What are his quirks? So they know you before you come. So I went from the CEO's office back to, <clears throat> to General Hospital, which is a separate department. I was trying to get different jobs, uh, thinking I wanted to become the personnel officer for the whole medical center. But I met this guy who, is, who has become my, one of the closest friends I have. And he was the administrator of General Hospital by the name of Richard Cordova. Richard went on to become, he ran the San Francisco County, city county health system, became the president of Kaiser, Northern California, retired from Kaiser. And his last job for 10 years was president CEO of LA Children's Hospital. But we became <clears throat> friends again because of work ethic. He would, I'd get to work at seven every morning and I would leave at six every night. He lived in Chatsworth, I lived in Whittier. Our cars would meet at the same time at the driveway and we'd walk up the stairs together. And every day he'd go, are you stalking me? I said, no, are you stalking me? He goes, he goes, and after a month of this, he said, come up and have coffee with me. So I, we had coffee and we started having this ritual of having coffee every morning at seven o'clock. He convinced me to leave personnel and my goal was to become the personnel director for LA County. I said, no, I'm going to personnel, I'm going to personnel. He goes, no, you'd be a great administrator. administrator. So I did that. And, you know, I think I did it very well to the point where he was going to appoint me his number two. And he wrote, back then you have to submit a letter to director of hospitals and also director of health services recommending someone for appointment to a key position. The director of hospitals took that letter, wrote back on it in his own handwriting. He said, he's the wrong ethnicity. You can only hire a Latino or an African-American. Or back then they said black. And so Rich gives me the letter. Mind you, I'm a personnel guy. <clears throat> and I said, this is blatantly illegal. They can't do this. He goes, yeah, what are you gonna do about it? He goes, here's your choice, Bill. You can either Sue, and you'll win. But you're 30, I was thinking about 33 at the time, but you'll be screwed. Not, not overtly, but they will screw you. Or go home, buy a great bottle of wine, tie one on, I'll see you Monday morning, and we'll prove to them that you could do it. And so that was only one. Another appointment was offered, was available down in Long Beach, right, in the Comprehensive Health Center and, and seven other smaller public health centers. And I was running the largest AMCARE program in the um, county at General Hospital. And I had the emergency room and I had housekeeping and security and a bunch of stuff. And they go, uh, they said, no, it's got to go to Latino. And I'm like, oh, again, again. She failed. It opened up again. Gave it to another Latino. He failed. And so finally, Rich stood up and said, you got to hire Fujioka. This guy knows what he's doing. Because they were going to, the center, for those of you in health services, is a process called, uh, the, it's an accreditation process. The Joint Council of Accreditation of health, health Care Facilities, something like that. I forget that, but the whole acronym. But they have to be accredited. If you're not accredited, you, do, you cannot qualify for Medi-Cal or Medicare reimbursement. It's a federal standard. Well, Long Beach was so messed up, they were gonna lose their accreditation. And they were put on notice. They were put on, they were penalized and put on notice. So they said, send Fujioka down there. So I went down there, long story short, we cleaned everything up, I worked like a dog, but, um, um, the, um, we had the, we had the, the survey from the joint console and we came out, we were the first 
facility in the history of uh, uh, health services to get accreditation with commendation. No one had ever done that. This was a big deal. The board made a big thing of it. And, and um, at that time, it was Dean Dana was the supervisor, but Don Kanai, Dean Dana had, you know, his last year or so, he had, he was slipping into dementia and Alzheimer's. But Don Kanabe did everything. So Don was just like, this is great, this is great, you saved this, you know, we're gonna lose the, you know, the center and so on. At the time though, I was working for this guy who was horrible, but I got a promotional offer to go back to personnel. So I went back to personnel as a division chief. I was there for about nine months. You know, I was sitting in my office and my secretary says, Bill, there's a guy named Mike on the phone. I said, Mike, what's his last name? They go, he won't tell me. He just said, it's Mike. Tell Bill it's Mike. So I pick up the phone and said, hi, Bill Fujioka. He goes, Bill, this is Mike. How are you doing? I immediately recognize his voice. It's Mike, Mike Antonovich. He says, Bill, my hospital at, at, uh, in High Desert, Lancaster, is losing its accreditation. And they're going to shut down. They had a skilled nursing facility. And the skilled nursing facility was horrific. We want you to, could you go up and say my hospital? And I said, no, supervisor. My boy is two years old. It's 110 miles from my house. I can, couldn't commute. I can try to commute. He goes, he goes, think about it. So I, I went home, talked to family, called, called the following Monday and said, I don't think I could do it. And he said, Bill, if you do it, I will consider it a personal favor if you fix my hospital. When well, the county, as you all know, if you can count to three, your future's pretty good. And I already had Kanabi. So it's like, so I told my, um, who became my ex-wife, I said, I gotta go. So I went up there for about a year and a half and cleaned everything up. When I tell you though, they know you before you come. The rumor was, well, the county CAO at the time put High Desert up to close, to close it, to lay everyone off. So the hospital felt that I was sent up there to close it. I literally, myself and another person, we wrote the book on workforce reduction, how to lay off the workforce. The whole process of going, of laying off people and going through the effective notice and everything else. And so they go, this guy wrote the damn book. So I went up there and I was getting nothing but death threats. Someone sent me a picture. I still have a picture somewhere of this knife that someone had sharpened on both sides. And this is a knife I'm going to use to kill you. And I can tell you where the second day I walked on that campus, there was on the community bulletin board was a recruitment brochure or bulletin or something for the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan. And I looked at it and said, is that the Klan? He goes, yeah. Is that recruitment poster? He goes, yeah, community bulletin board. They can put anything out they want on that board. I said, well, hell no, and I tore it down. Went back up the next day, tore it down again. The third day, the guy came in to talk to me. And he said, hey, you know, boy? I said, mm, don't call me boy. He goes, you can't do that. It's a community bulletin board. I said, I don't give a crap. I'm not going to let a uh, clan you know, operate in this hospital. He goes, you need to be careful, boy. I said, OK. So I had visions of getting my head blown up, driving down. Uh, <laughs> the, the hospital is eight miles from Highway 14. But it was one of my best assignments. But I kept telling people, and again, you go back to work ethic. In hospitals, the care staff work 12, 12-hour 12 shifts. Nursing staff, you know, LVN staff, attendant staff, you know, pharmacists, and so on. And the parking lot was in front. Everyone had to come to the front door or exit from the front door. So I'd get there and I'd stand at the front door with my coffee and say, good morning, good night, good morning, good night. The first week it was, if you, asshole, you know, they'll bumble under their breath. You're a jerk. You know, we know you're trying to close this. And I ain't trying to close it. We're going to keep this place open. And they even had an event where we, they circled hands around the hospital to save it. And uh, I went out there and they screamed at me, you can't stop us. I said, shut up, get, let me get in line. So I picketed with them. It was on TV and all this stuff. 
And I finally convinced them that I was there to, um, to um, save the hospital. When I left, I, I, after a year, we fixed everything, got fully licensed, fully accredited. And I told Mike, uh, it's about, I was there about mm, maybe 13, 14 months. I called him up and said, I got to go home. Because my little boy called me one day and said, when are you going to visit me again, Daddy? I miss you. And I said, Mike, because I was living up there during the week. I, I tried to drive and I almost, I almost died one day. I just I was so tired. So I li lived up there and I said, Mike, I got to go home. It's my guy. And he says, fine. Everything was fixed. And there's a, I had a number two up there who was, she went on to, to run the hospital. She was an African-American woman who was just truly exceptional. But it was, uh, it was one of my favorite assignments. There were 800 people at the hospital. When I left, a uh, little over 700 signed a petition asking me to stay. And that was one of the, my, one of the most treasured things I have. Well, you know, Bill, I mean, this, all of these stories is just fantastic because it just goes to show that, you know, within the county, there's lots of opportunities for everyone. Everywhere. It's a, you can yeah. go, from, you can do with mental health. You Absolutely. can go and do, you know, DPSS. You can do children's services. The, the opportunities, if you're not afraid to take a chance, are, in my mind, endless. And you just have to be willing to step out. Of, a lot of us, a lot of folks have comfort zones. They don't, want to, they don't want to step outside their comfort zone. They don't want to try something different. But every time you try something new, you know, I used to tell people, today's a great day, I learned something new. Having intellectual curiosity is vital. Now, I'd walk around in different assignments, and every so often you, you go by someone's desk and they're playing something on the computer. And I say, well, what do you play on your computer? They're like, oh, well, sorry. But I said, no, I don't care. As long as you have your work done. I said, he goes, I'm done. Everything's caught up. I said, well, so you're retiring? And they said, no, I used to be a young person. And I said, if you don't have an assignment, go to your boss and ask for one. Or see those file cabinets? Find a, a file that's as thick as could be and read the file. Look at it from, you know, cradle to grave. Look at it from, you know, the, the, the first motion all the way to implementation and learn from something. Have that curiosity and be, just, just, just be prepared because, you know, you know what's interesting? That, um, you know, racism is always going to be with us. And, you know, for Asians, for whatever reason, you know, we get a lot of labels placed on us, or whether or not we're strong enough to lead something, or whether or not we're vocal enough, or whether or not we're, you know, creative enough, or whatever. Being able to, you'll have multiple opportunities to demonstrate your strength, or you create your own opportunities. Someone, sometimes people don't do that because they're afraid to get out of their comfort zone. Now, I find truck the day. I'll give you a real funny story about High Desert. So I, even though I was going to save the hospital, I had to lay off about, I think it was like 22 people. And mind you, I'm working like hard, like the hell, and develop friendships and relationships and so on. And so I'm going to do the layoffs. And one person came up to me and said, hey, I'm going to make up the name. Hey, you going to lay off Dave? And I said, yeah, I need Dave. Dave is in a classification this hospital does not need because it had something to do with building and trades. I said, we just don't need it. We're not building anything. He goes, you know, you know, Dave is crazy. He's a burnt out uh, vet, but he was a long distance sniper in the Vietnam War. I said, really? He goes, yeah. And he's crazy. And Dave always wore army fatigues. His pickup truck was fully camouflaged. And he's, Dave was about six, six, one, six, two. I said, okay. So I'm giving out the letters and I have Dave's uh, layoff letter right here. <laughs> and he's standing in the corner and he goes, hey, Fujioka, where's my layoff letter? And I said, what are you talking about, Dave? He said, I heard you're going to hit me. And I said, that's people just trying to create problems, Dave. 
I need you. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Once you save the hospital, we'll be building again. And I give you my word of honor, as long as I'm the, the administrator here, you'll always have a job. He goes, really? Really, boss? I said, word of honor. Puts his arm around me and says, I hear you're getting death threats. I said, yeah. He goes, let me know. I can hit a target this big at 1,100 yards. I said, really, Dave? He goes, yeah. I said, okay. So the following week, I'm walking around the campus, like I always would. And he, he sees me, he goes, hey, boss, come over here. And pickup truck, opens up this pickup truck, has this beautiful lacquered wood case. He goes, I want you to see my baby. And he opens it up. It's a 50 caliber sniper rifle. The next two are targets this big. And he goes, now look at this. He goes, you want to touch my baby? Goes, and he, he put gloves on. He goes, here. I said, no, 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 that's okay, Dave. You, you, you ever see the 50 caliber sniper rifle? It's big. Then he puts out another box about this big. He goes, these are my the bullets for my baby. I make them myself. They're loaded with so many grains of this and some of this, this, and that fully balanced. And see this target? I can hit a target this big at 1,100 yards. That's 11 football fields. And he goes, and, you know, he told me some of the things he did during the war. And he said, and some of you may not know what a ghillie sack is. But if you've ever watched a war movie, and you see these guys with uh, men and women snipers, they have these uh, like camouflage suits on. They look like little leaves on it, all that netting and stuff. It's called a ghillie sack. He's like, I got my ghillie sack here too, boss, I'm ready. You tell me who you want and I can lay out in the desert 1,100 yards away <laughs> and he'll, the person will never hear it and the bullet will go through four cinder block walls. They'll never find the bullet, it'll completely disintegrate. So let me know. I put my arm around and I said, you know, I love you, don't you? <laughs> you know, as long as I'm here, you always have a job. He goes, I got it, boss. Don't worry, I got you back, boss. I got you back. <laughs> Scariest man I ever worked with. Well, it, it ended up working out, obviously, for you, for him, and for the hospital. So that's fantastic. Um, you know, could you share no, no, one of your... Go ahead. Well, to continue on that, uh, I don't know where you were going, but so that was high desert. I went back to personnel. Um, got my, you know, I, I finished that assignment, went back to personnel. I was there for about, when I was at High Desert, they had all these newspaper articles. Turnaround artist saves, you know, High Desert Hospital. You know, he saved Long Beach, then he saved Long, you know, High Desert Hospital. And there must have been 10 articles. And so I go back to personnel. And um, about eight months later, the city of Los Angeles was looking for personnel director. And they called, the mayor's office called, was calling different places. But of course they called the assistant directors for the county personnel department, Ed Barrios and forget the other ones. But they said, would you want this job? They go, no, no, no. But if you want someone who's good, talk to Fujioka, our division chief. And um, so finally this one woman called me. And she, it was interesting that when she called because Again, it's all relationships, right? When I was a personnel director at General Hospital, I had this great relationship with this orthopedic doctor who is a number two in the Department of Orthopedics. And General Hospital is just a fabulous place. And that's where my love of public, of public services really developed because what they do for people, when you have these geniuses, this Marty Weiss, the number one neurosurgeon in the world, treating patients at General Hospital. But there's one guy named Pat Sackis, who is an amazing man of Greek heritage. And so he's, um, he's, um, he, he was someone I worked closely with. Fast forward, looking for personnel director, the person in Dick Reardon's office, given the task to find someone to work, um, to be the new personnel director, is Dr. Pat Sackis' daughter. And, um, she goes, you know, I'm, I'm trying to convince this guy to get the job. I go, well, where is he? Who is he? He goes, well, I, you know, he, he, he works in the county right now. His name is Bill Fujioka. Oh, my God, I love Bill Fujioka. You got to get him to take the job. The guy's amazing. Again, intersections in life. And so I told him no, because I could count to two already. If I can get one of the other ones, you know, I have a great career going with the county. But then he goes, just please, please, please. So 10 minutes before five on the last day to file, 
I faxed in my application. I felt, I said, well, I'll go through the process. It'd be interesting to go through the department head process. Went through the process and um, a lot of pushback from these, some, the old school personnel type because I wasn't just personnel. I was health services, I was other things. And again, another story where I'm in my office and my secretary said, hey, some guy named Dick is on the phone. I said, who? Dick, just Dick. I said, I don't know any Dick. He said, well, it's on the phone. Oh, Bill Fujioka. Hey, Bill, it's, it's Dick Reardon. How you doing? I want to offer you the job. I'm like, well, this could be interesting. So I went back to personnel. Now, mind you, when I went back, there are people there this is a 97 who worked with me in 75. And they're like, you're back? And Bernie Parks was the assistant chief at that time. Well, I was a personnel director for two years and Keith Comrie, who was a CAO, retired. I went to Reardon and I said, I can become your CAO. And Reardon was, he is a fascinating person. He had the attention span of a gnat on speed. But when he would lock in, because he, you know, he was amazingly wealthy, and he would read at least 10 books at the same time. And you can ask him anything about any one of the books, and he'd tell you. He, he knew exactly where he was at and the storyline and so on. When St. Mary's College folded, he bought their entire library and built a library on his property. And it was his goal to read all the books. But anyway, so he offers me the job as the CAO and people were angry because I, I was, again, I was an outsider. But I asked, you know, sometimes we don't ask. Sometimes we, in, in Japanese, we say, gaman, we gaman. You kind of endure in silence, you know, gaman, gaman. It's like, screw gaman. But I just asked. So I had that opportunity. That was, uh, um, I did that for, from 99 to 2006. And then I left. But one time I left, it was, it was, it was interesting. I, I had experience where there was, I was dealing with corruption on something. And I was so angry. I was at the center table. If you've ever been in the city hall um, council chambers, there's a center table where they put department heads. And this guy tried to give his friend this major contract. And I said, why well, mess around? And the way he structured the qualifications, only he could qualify. So I said it to him, I said, why well, screw around? Why don't you just say his name? Everyone knows what you're trying to do. I never should have done that. Because you, you don't, I didn't, I was angry at the person, but I embarrassed the body. And at that point, I was just, I said, you know what? I got to go. It's time for me, seven years is enough. And I, I went to retire, and that's when the county started calling me. Called me. I turned them down four times until they said they're going to change the structure. And I said, okay, um, and these departments will report to you. It'll be a new experience on some of stuff. And I said, okay. And then I spent another seven years with the county. And it was a wonderful seven years. Um, you know, Bill, in the stories that you've shared today, um, it's really touched on the fact that, you know, you, you were treated differently um, at times because you were Asian. And, you know, that takes us to the topic, one of the topics of the night that we'd love to hear your thoughts on. Um, there's a lot of things going on in America right now with um, anti-Asian sentiment and APA, AAPI hate. And, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? And, you know, what do you think is, is the right step forward um, for everyone to deal with that? I, the, the main thing is, um, you know, it, it's interesting when I talk to folks who are not part of the AAPI community, and they'll say, God, this is just starting. I said, no bullshit. It's been here forever. It started with, you know, the first AAPIs who came to America were Chinese Americans. Uh, I, I don't know if, if people know the story that in the original doc, the original, uh, not doctrine, but the original, um, the founding documents in University of Stanford, it said anyone of Chinese descent cannot attend Stanford. Because at one point, um, 
when they when the, the the Leland Stanford was building his railroad and he refused to pay a lot of uh, Chinese workers. Well, they kidnapped his son and killed him, and then he wiped out a bunch of them. It was horrible. This was a long, long time ago, and so that wasn't changed until probably in the early 1900s. They finally took that language out of it, but it's not new. What they did to the um, Chinese Americans and and what's happened to every AAP, AAPI community, you know, the, the, the forced removal of the Japanese Americans and pla placing them in concentration camps when over half were American citizens. My mom was born here. She was placed in a camp. We lost, our families lost everything. My wife's family had a um, uh, over a hundred acre farm in, in um, Orange County, lost everything. It just, the government just took everything. And so it's just here. It's something that um, oftentimes we don't speak up. You know, we need to have a stronger voice. You know, I told a bunch of kids one day, I said, you want a voice? Vote. Uh, become, 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 uh, become relevant in a sense. You know, right now, you know, I would join forces with the city because, you know, people who work, who, you know, cities, uh, Asian Association or other Asian associations, and then go work the polls, Not, go work, um, go work on campaigns, go work in um, getting people to donate because the only way, whether it's the supervisors or members of the city council or members of the state legislature, will listen to you if they think they get something out of you. They, they tend to be very selfish, very focused on their own ambitions, but you use it to your advantage. And you go out there and you, you hook yourself to a, a, a candidate and who is very vocal and will support AAPI initiatives and bring bodies out. And they'll go, wait a minute, look at this. Ooh, this is a group that could help me. Well, they're doing it for selfish reasons. You do it for reasons of survival. You do it to get out there and make a difference and but be someone who they see. You, you know what's really interesting is that little known fact, in the state of Georgia, the African Americans and what um, you know the, the vote the, they get out the vote, uh, what happened and how that really helped Biden and the two senators. But there's a story I read, I think it was New York Times, that said Asians came out as a block. And they, they said it was the Asians, AAPI community, who put Biden over because they voted as a block. And they put him over the top in Georgia and they put a lot of those, the two senators over. You know, Biden right now, I think, you know, Biden's this breath of fresh air and gracious and all this other stuff. And Kamala, you know, we all know she's, she's half Asian. And in some respects, she's doing it for her. But don't fool yourself. He's not doing it just for her. He knows that we're one of the fastest growing um, communities in the United States. And the AAPIs, you know, at one point, we talk about Asian Americans, and then it became, well, first we have our own separate groups, and then it became Asian Americans, and, but the Pacific Islanders were left out. And the poverty levels of Pacific Islanders are as worse as any, any group in America. And so you come together as a group, oh my God, it's amazingly powerful. But if they feel that, uh, you represent a, a block of votes, they will stand up. But it's gotta be verbal. And numbers, numbers just count, folks. You gotta get out there. And you gotta get out there and, and talk to the kids. Now some of these the young kids, all the millennials, just drive me freaking crazy. <laughs> the, um, the, um, they're, I can see that old activism coming out, but you know, it's, you know, walking on the street and protesting, God bless you. Vote. 
that candidates know that you're a block behind them. Get out and do stuff. You know, whether it's, um, you know, people donating. A lot of people donate money individually. Um, donate to the association and say, these are our members, and here are the names of all of our members, but as our association members just gave $10,000 to a candidate. And that could be $2,500, or it could be a hundred, you know, $100 donations. But instead of, you know, a hundred bucks in truck, and they go, a ah, hundred bucks in truck. If it's $10,000 from the Asian American Employees Association, you go, ooh, that's something, all right. Cause Money is their life is their lifeblood, right? That's what they that's that's what they need to get their campaigns going. But even more important, show up at their sites, maybe walk a precinct or get on a phone bank or do something as a group. But I, I get even even LA County, I know everyone has such strong ties to their individual ethnicity. Because it's the Vietnam, Vietnamese Employees Association, the Chinese Employees Association, it's the Filipino Employees Association. The, um, it is fine to have the separate associations, but you should have at least once a year, all of you should come together and say, what can we do to work together? We all respect our you know, the different associations, but as a group, what can we do? That as a block, just think, because you have, you have hundreds of people in all those different associations. You come together, and everyone throws in 100 bucks. You know, all of a sudden, you're making a statement that a supervisor will listen to. And if you say, in our association, there could be a, you don't have to have, because people will still stay within their associations. Chuck is Vietnamese, but, you know, there's the, I used to go to, I probably would go to eight Christmas parties for AAPIs, but they're all different groups. But say, okay, that's fine. But as a political action committee, let's, let's come together and hold hands and then kind of coalesce around one candidate and push that candidate. And they'll say, ooh, this is a group we got to listen to. That's when you get influence, folks. No, absolutely, Bill. And that's that's actually one of our priorities, um, you know, this year. It's just really getting all the organizations together to speak, you know, with one voice. Um, now, your comments about, you know, being vocal and getting out of the community, uh, you know, I have a question um, from uh, one of our uh, folks, and they, they want to understand, you know, Asians usually are considered or have been coined the model minority. You know, what, what does that mean to you, um, you know, now these days? And then what do you think, you know, based on what us being coined the model of minority means in relation to, you know, some of our other communities of color um, that we engage with every day? Yeah, it's, it's, it's um, to a large extent, it's insulting. But I go back to the Japanese term, gaman, kind of endure in silence. And um, I can't tell you the number of times my parents would say, don't make waves. Don't draw attention to yourself. I know my mom, God bless her. When I told her I was going to become a department head, she goes, you need to have reasonable expectations. <laughs> and, and I bet you a lot of the people listening today, their parents would say, just, just get a good job. Just get something to be stable. And they're not encouraging you to, to speak out. I, um, I got expelled from high school because at one point they were going around the room in my trigonometry class and asking everyone what college they're going to. This guy got to me and said, where are you going to school, Bill? You, what are you going to do, Bill? And I said, well, I'm going to go to UC Santa Cruz. He goes, why waste your parents' money? Go buy a lawnmower and become a gardener because that's all you people know what to do. So I told him to do something physically impossible. And my buddy, who went on to become a commander for the sheriff's department, stood up and said, yeah, we know you're a Nazi. And um, they expelled me. But the, I, had this, I was a class officer and I had a great relationship with the um, principal. And he said, what happened, Bill? And I said, what happened? Did you tell him to? And I said, yeah, I did. And I cussed him out pretty, pretty loudly. 
And my buddy, we called him a Nazi, and said, you know, we looked in his drawer. He's literally a Nazi. And he goes, well, you should be going through his drawer. I said, well, you know, we have to look for pencil. <laughs> you know, but he had the Nazi paraphernalia in his drawer. And I said, okay, I'm going to reinstate you. But he wants to flunk you. And I said, I won't be able to get in school. He flunks me. He goes, okay, give you a C minus. I said, okay, we'll do that. But it's, you know, we're expected to gum on, to put our head down, to not speak up, to be meek and mild. And someone put that definition of us on us of being model. What's model? You're compliant. You don't make waves. You know, you don't cause any dis disruption because it's modeled to someone else. He said, well, the, the, here's one ethnic group who isn't causing all this stuff. So they must be model. Well, um, in the, in the AAPI community, you know, it's a warrior community. The strength of our respective, you know, communities, whether you're Chinese Americans or what the Vietnamese went through to the war. And I had friends who, I don't know how your family came over truck, but I had friends who you know, had to experience that boat ride and just that was us. Of, just we were refugees in, on a boat. Floating in the ocean until finally landing somewhere and going through relocation camps and everything else. And the, the journey was, we people don't make that journey. You know, we people do not survive that journey. You know, my, my grandfather, he came over right at the time they passed this law saying this Alien Exclusionary Act that said no more, you know, Asians. And he, they landed in Los Angeles and the guy goes, can't take them here. They just passed a new federal law. So the captain drove him around Baja and dropped him off in Mexico and said, welcome to America. My grandfather told me later, he goes, you know, I thought Huck Jeans, which is a white guy, were bigger. These are little brown guys. You know, we could, and they spoke a funny language. Some of us were trying to learn English. They spoke this different language. Well, they dropped them off in Mexico. And they, the first job they got was in the mines of Zacatecas. And what you can't do is put a farmer underground. The farmer needs, he's like a plant. He needs the sunlight to grow. And so they walked from Zacatecas, Mexico, through Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and on to California. But that's, weak people don't do that. You know, you have the strength in the uh, AAPI communities, you know, what the Chinese went through. You know, there's the horrific stories of what they went through. And, you know, there's that, there's that tree in Chinatown, huge tree, but they should make a memorial. As they hung 11 Chinese there. You know, the, the, there's a hang, hangman's tree there. We people don't endure what AAPIs have done. And just time to stand up. I'm not saying, I'm not saying you burn down something and tear something down, but you stand up and, and you show the strength that everyone has. You know, because oh, what they endured in their countries is, is amazing. No, and we absolutely agree. I mean, those are just wonderful and insightful thoughts. Now, um, I wanted to touch the, though on the, you know, what about re race relations with Asians, you know, and other minority groups right now? I mean, I can share that, you know, when we had the Black Lives Matter and all the George Floyd issues, you know, I went with my family, you know, we're half Asian and my husband's white, and we went out and we marched um, with everyone, you know, and we shared our voice, you know, with BLMs and to speak out. And you know, do you what do you see um, in reflection now? Um, now that you know we're targeted, and of course, you know we've always been targeted, but it seems to be much more prevalent now. I think that's so important. I think you know, holding hands, reaching out across you know, I call it ethnic lines, is just so critical. So that when you're out there, you look to your right, you can see someone who is. Uh, a Latino, or you look to your right, you see someone African American, or even you know, look in the other direction. It could be a white, a white person. But reaching out and making sure that that our presence is there is real important. But you know, you have. I just saw something on TV. I think on CNN, where um, an African American guy attacked a 65 year old 
Asian AAPI woman. The, the, um, you know, racism uh, is not exclusive. You know, some of the most racist things said to me were not said by white guys. You know, a lot was said by white guys, but we're just not said. It's, but standing up and speaking up and educating people, you gotta be real careful because there are some nutballs out there. You know, I had some guy just the other day started barking at me. And, you know, I, I tend to have a temper and I barked back a little bit and I came home and told my wife and she goes, you need to be careful. You're going to get hurt real bad one day. And, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a young guy anymore who could, you know, fight for an hour. You know, probably only good for about two or three minutes, but it'll be one hell of a two or three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, you know, Bill, um, I want to shift, you know, back to the county a little bit now and, you know, just talk about, I don't know if you've noticed, but we have. Um, and I have a question here that I want to pose to you um, from one of our participants. Um, there, when you were here as a CEO, you know, we had a lot of API department heads. We had Janice, Wendy, you know, Sachi, the whole bit. Um, you know, by our count, uh, we have no API uh, department heads right now. We're amazing. Yeah. Just amazing. And, you know, and and that's why you, that the board, a, a politician, and God bless them all, but it's a different world now, but politicians are, um, they will pay attention if, you know, if, if you make a difference for them. And differences, whether it's campaigns or where it's um, getting out to vote or whatever. And you got to make your mark. You got to be, you got to be present. And you got to tell them, they're going to say, we'll be there for you, but you need to be there for us. And to be vocal right now. At one point, you know, there should be, you know, someone should speak up and say, where are all the AAPIs? You know, Supervisor Holly Mitchell or, you know, Barker has, uh, I think she's pretty supportive of the AAPI community because she has such a large part of her district of Asian American, you know, Pacific Islanders. But say, where's what's going on? What's happening? We went from four to zero. You know, at one point, the um, it looked like most appointments are going to African Americans. Now, that's not to denigrate any one ethnic group because every ethnic group has had challenges and hasn't been able to get. You know, before you know, I was the first person of color to be the CAO or the CEO of LA City and LA County. It was all white. It just was almost unheard of. And it's, um, you know, it's just, I, I think make, make it a difference, but a difference isn't one day. It's not one meeting. It's a commitment, folks. It's, 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 you gotta keep pushing and pushing and pushing. But again, you as a group, if they see that you're bringing in votes, you're generating votes for them, or generating their, 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 their lifeblood, and that's campaign cash. They'll start listening to people and say, okay, we gotta do something. But it's, it's, it's a systemic issue, I think, in the county. When you have, for, for eight APIs to uh, not have anything is obscene. It makes, but who, who has said anything? No one has said anything. I think part of it is uh, right now, there's such a huge media crush on it, and thankfully so, on anti-Asia, you know, hate crimes and so on. Someone has to be as vocal about it. Someone has to say anything. But part of it is saying, well, you know what? It, it's not just the person calling me a chap. That's in your face. It's a person denying AAPI's opportunities is just as hateful as being called a Jap or whatever it is for all these different ethnic groups, right? Because that's just as bad. But when people have the opportunity to talk to say, we need to give AAPI's uh, you know, greater opportunities in all avenues, look at the county, 
Look at, I don't know if there's any in the city. Look at the city. There's not a single AAPI department head in the county or I think the city. I don't know all the city department heads that well. But I would just say it. And that's not, that's not pointing at the um, one of the supervisors. That's not saying, well, supervisor X has denied these opportunities because that could be difficult. But make it a statement to say, the one way that AAPIs gain more respect is through visibility. Because you get individuals in positions of responsibility who are successful, they go, wow, and he's AAPI. That's great. Because before, you know, whether you can name all these different ethnic groups, you know, when they say, oh, he or she just doesn't have fill in the blanks. And it could be anything. At one point, who was that? Al Campanis. He was a general manager for the Dodgers. Wonderful, was an exceptional guy. But he, they asked, talking to him about the, um, an African American becoming a, 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 a manager of a baseball team. And he said something about not having the necessary capabilities, requirements or something. He got fired immediately. But people would think that. People think that AAPIs are not strong enough, we're not vocal enough, we're not fill in the blank to be at that level. So you gotta get people at that level, you gotta show them. But the only way they can get at that level is if elected officials will give people the opportunity. But the fact there's not a single AAPI department head, oh my God, there should be, someone should be saying something. <clears throat> but you don't attack the politician you make a statement, when you have the opportunity to make statements in the, whether it's the paper or any kind of media source and so on to say, it's systemic. It is, you can see, for example, in the county, there's no one above this level who is uh, a department head level who's AAPI. And that, that sends the wrong message. It sends, you know, it's, it says we're not worth it. No, absolutely. And then, of course, it's imperative as well for LA County employees who are of AAPI descent to actually get out there and apply and, and seek those opportunities. So we have candidates to put before them. You no, know, it's, it's um, I used to say every, every couple of years, I, I would poke my head out of my hole and see where the next hole was, you know, and see what other opportunities were. Yeah, you know, sometimes again we get comfortable, and not just AAPIs. People in general, it's like, well, I know my job, and and I'm I'm comfortable with it. I have all these challenges at home. I have these other, you know, I, I may have parents living with me, especially AAPI communities. You know, it's not uncommon for four generations to live together, and so, but I have these other family obligations. Well, the um. By, by moving up the ladder, you, you, know, you present opportunities not only for your, your family, because income and whatever, but for people who follow you, who come in after you. But it's, you know, even, you know what's interesting? I'll give you one, one quick thing. I bet you the vast majority of you, when you go to a big event, whether it's a, it's a, it's a LA County Managers event or it's a, any kind of large event, you go to the, you go there, you look around, and you see people you know, and you sit at that table, because that's another comfort zone. I want to be comfortable. It's difficult for me to branch out, but the only way you know to be, become a real good leader, you have to be able to develop relationships. You have to be able to you know walk in cold and start talking to people. Next time, go sit at a table we know nobody and just talk to them and develop a relationship. Because that, those simple interactions, if you can talk to a table of 10 strangers, then you can talk to a room of 20 strangers. Then you can talk to a room of 50 strangers because you're developing your social skills, right? Every day you should be developing something. But we try to be comfortable. You know, we stay within our little cocoon. And that's, I think that has held us back too. And being able to see, I think growing up in First Boro Heights and in Montebello, 
because although there is there there are Japanese Americans in Boyle Heights and Montebello, I went to school and it's the melting pot. So you start and then you know we did sports and everything else. You start interacting with different cultures. Each interaction teaches you a skill. And it teaches you know I used to and then they you know, you get in fights. But you know, I think one of the best things is get your ass kicked once in a while. <laughs> Seriously, because it teaches you respect and humility. You don't do stupid, because if you do stupid, someone's going to beat the hell out of you. But if you stand up for yourself, and then people would go, you know, you have some guys who jump. I, I got beat up a lot, but um, it was a long day for somebody. <laughs> and they don't say, I want jump food, you, okay. you, know, <laughs> you, you can beat them, you'll win. But oh man, he bit me one day. <laughs> you know, it's a long yeah, day. No. Bill, um, we're nearing um, the 8.30 mark, and I want to be respectful of your time, but I've got I'm, one more I'm not question. going anywhere. And I, <laughs> yeah, you're retired. I but still I, get up got, at 6 in the morning, though. Uh, but we've got one big question. Your quick thoughts. Uh, what do you think of an Asian supervisor on the county board? And what do you think uh, does it take to make that happen? I was hoping that through the redistricting process, it would not be hard to create an Asian district, but I'm of the opinion there should be seven board offices. Having five and two million each is just, you look at the, even, even Catherine's district. And the Catherine district goes from where I live all the way up to High Desert, up to Lancaster. I'm not pointing at her because I, 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 th I think she's great. But it's the geographic diversity, the ethnic diversity, the uh, everything is too big. You know? And so you can create, seven, I was hoping they would create seven districts and I've mentioned it to as many politicians as I could. Um, and people are always afraid, oh, we shouldn't create more government. Oh my God, no. For to represent the people better, I would break it into um, seven districts, and by doing so, you can carve out uh, AAPI district. Because you know, you start when I went to high school. I think my junior high had three AAPIs. The other one shared a bedroom with me, and then there's a, a Korean um, girl down the street. My high school probably had about 50. My son went to Temple City High. It was 92% Asian at Temple City High. So you, you look at San Gabriel, Temple City, Alhambra, Rosemead, large Vietnamese population, Rosemead. Uh, a friend of mine's, um, his wife's father um, is a minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, one of the largest Seventh-day Adventist Church for, for Vietnamese in that area. But you, you go in those communities, you know, um, San Marino, I can name a bunch of them, a lot of AAPIs there. You can carve out that little swap right there and make it, you know, Arcadia is right there, Sam, you know, Sierra Madre. Hell, we're all over the place there. <laughs> you know, right. And that community, that San Gabriel Valley kind of community, he's carved out an AAPI district. And it's, but again, who's going to do it? The only way they'll do it is we have a limited number of AAPIs in the state legislature is by, become, you know, making a difference and grabbing onto some candidates and say, this is what has to happen. And the ones, the, the few that I know that will listen, I'll say, yeah, it's something we should do. But I go back to, it's kind of harsh to say there's selfish motives, but let's say political motives. What's in it for them? Um, some don't want to be carved out of office, but if they know that their position is safe, but by doing so, they bring in this huge block of AAPI voters, and with that campaign dollars, you get a champion in a second. But you got to have a champion. There's got to be someone there. The board's not going to say, oh, divide us up and you know, go from five to seven. They're, they'll hold on to that with a stranglehold, right? <laughs> but it's got to be the state legislature. 
And it's, I think it's, I think, I think it'll come at one point. They got to go to seven districts. Five is crazy. No, fantastic. Well, Bill, thank you for those really insightful thoughts. I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure um, to have you tonight. And, you know, thank you so much for kicking off our speaker series. <laughs> Um, you know, so it's been fantastic. Um, we don't have anything additional. And again, we just want to thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. Everyone take care. Be safe. And, and just be, just watch out for the knuckleheads out there. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Great. Thank Fair you off. so much. And See thank ya. you, everyone. Bye. So I just want to remind everyone, uh, this, uh, this session was recorded. Uh, we will uh, try to provide it uh, uh, at some point, maybe on a website, uh, opportunity for your friends also listen to this. Uh, again, uh, our website is lacaaea.com. Uh, check us out on social media. Media, follow us if you can find us. Um, I myself is am a poor representative of uh, a social media user, um, but our website's pretty easily to get to. Uh, if you can sign up for our um, newsletters, our notifications. You could send a, your email to, and I'll put it in the chat right now, to uh, mliang, L-I-A-N-G dot L-A-C-A-A-E-A at Gmail. And what we are offering for a limited time is to sign up and you'll, you'll get notices, you'll get our newsletters. Um, we're offering it to anyone who's not a member of the association. And for those of you who are part of another employees association, we look forward to working with you and speaking with you. And uh, please, uh, please, you know, be um, on the lookout for all our uh, notifications. Uh, Truck, thank you very much for an enlightening evening. Uh, and everyone else, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Good night.